morning in Washington, good afternoon in Kiev and in other European capitals. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful panel for you today. We have with us um, General Phil Breedlove, the former Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. We have Dr. Hannah Shalest, Director of Security Studies at the Foreign Policy Council of Ukraine and Prism, and Editor-in-Chief of Ukraine Analytica. And we have Ambassador William Taylor, Vice President of, for Russia and Europe at the US Institute of Peace. We were supposed to have Admiral Jamie Fogo, but we learned late last night that he's come down with something, so he will not be joining us today. But our subject, of course, is the new phase in Moscow's war on Ukraine, its offensive in the East. And we've had many developments over the past few days, uh, pointing to a, a very good discussion. Okay, I will start with General Breedlove. What is the current Russian order of battle as they prepare to advance in the East and the South? There is some speculation that Putin wants a victory of some kind in time for the May 9 celebration of Moscow's victory in World War II. Is this feasible? Well, first of all, John, thanks for having me here. I'm glad to be on such a talented and familiar team um, as we do what we can for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Much is being said about what's going on on the Eastern Front, and I, I think a few scene setting remarks are key, and then we'll talk about the AOB. It's about a 300 mile front. It's a twisty, windy front, but about a 300 mile front. In the midst of this, of course, Mariupol still stands to a certain degree, but we're watching some really ugly things play out in Mariupol. And uh, I believe that our nation in the West needs to stand up and call an end to some of it. We see what uh, most um, uh, ground military thinkers would call shaping and probing going on to this point. No real major thrusts have started yet, but that is not necessarily good news. This actually may portend that they're gonna be a little smarter here than they were in the North where they took a whipping. And so I think that uh, we should be watching clearly how this shaping and probing takes place to give us some idea of what could happen and where they might push through. So much is said about numbers. If you remember before the war, we were counting the tens of thousands of troops and number of battalion tactical groups, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, I think what we've learned so far is that those numbers are uh, informative, but they may not be demonstrative. And so, uh, with that, it's, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little tepid to say that right now we see about 76 battalion task groups in the East. We think that maybe 11, 12, or 13 of those are brand new that have been brought from other theaters to fight. I believe that we can safely say that the battalion task groups that were taken out of the fight in the North and repurposed to the East are probably not not at full strength, uh, and they may have some remaining problems from the losses that they took in the North. Um, things that uh, do not portend well for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. We see a better emphasis, better meaning Russian better, emphasis on attack aviation, both fixed wing and rotary wing, and so uh, they look to try to solve their problems of a combined armed approach that they had in the North and were unable to affect, and that cost them dearly. We all understand that they have a new commander and that he has sort of tasked reorganized the, the forces and that he will be calling the shots on what I just spoke about. The probing and the shaping will tell him where to put his main effort as he tries to find weakness in the, the uh, Ukrainian forces. And we believe that uh, much has been said in the press, but we do believe that the terrain in the South lends itself better to Russian style fighting. So before we, before we declare that a big boon, let's remember, let's just remember how well the Ukrainian forces prepared in the North and let's give them credit for having thought this equally through. And so Russia will face a stiff resistance. 
Okay, so uh, as to the victory by May 9th, based on what I just said, which I think is really important, and that is that Ukraine has been preparing for this. And this is a military that's already demonstrated incredible imagination and an incredible resiliency. And I don't think this is going to be easy for Russia again. Russia may be able to bring mass and that will make a difference. But I believe that Ukraine will be ready as they have been before. And I think it's, John, you asked me to go out on a limb. I think it's unlikely they're going to be able to declare a big victory by the ninth. They may take down Mariupol by the ninth, and that may be their big victory. But I don't believe that we'll see the kind of parade that Mr. Putin is counting on by the ninth. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, Hannah, uh, let's see now. President Zelensky said that Moscow has begun its new offensive. How do you see Ukraine coping with this? And do you believe that Putin's aims are now limited to Ukraine's south and east? Or does he still want to control the government of Ukraine? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, controlling the government, that's the interesting notion, because originally it's been even the saying about changing the uh, uh, government uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, definitely as the final goal, uh, the Russian leadership would prefer to control uh, Ukrainian government in terms of being sure uh, where it goes, uh, uh, first of all, uh, in foreign policy, but also sometimes in terms of domestic policy and some economic developments that can be reliable on the Russian Federation rather than on the cooperation with the Europe Union. But that is the ultimate goal. That is something for the uh, um, future, not for the current moment. It seems uh, to me that uh, more or less in the Kremlin, they realize that changing the government is not possible for them. So that's why they would prefer a uh, sort of suppress uh, rather than a uh, political change um, in Ukraine. But nevertheless, you know, what is um, happening, and it's not just the desire to control uh, the south of east, that is just the limited options that the Russian Federation has as for now. Definitely what we saw on the north, and originally we knew that the idea being to fight on the north, so coming to Kiev, on the east, uh, widening the uh, uh, territories of the uncontrolled Donetsk and Lugansk um, uh, uh, republics, and on the uh, southeast uh, to make the landline from uh, Russia to Crimea. And the last but not the least is taking Odessa, because that's important psychologically and strategically to cut Ukraine uh, off from the sea. Russia was not planning to take the whole Ukraine, but these for, um, let's name them theaters, not even the region, being extremely important. Losing around Kyiv demonstrated the limited capacities. That's why we see the concentration of the forces and a better coordination of the Russian forces. The uh, appointment of General Dvornikov, that's first of all, uh, for the first time after 50 days of the war, demonstrated that Russians realized that they cannot have the individual assaults. They need a coordinator of the operation. And only after 50 days, they appointed him. Uh, the bad news that this guy has a nickname of Butcher, a Syrian butcher, so the guy who is uh, uh, bad known um, in Syria. But the good news for Ukraine that he has never had an experience of such a big battles. So uh, uh, the question is, will he be able to coordinate all these amount of forces and of the different directions where the assault and counter assault um, are happening? That's why it seems to me as for now, they concentrated on the uh, um, suppression of Mariupol. There they used all types of the forces. But in other regions, we see more of the airstrikes. And these airstrikes are happening not only on the east of the country and northeast of the country, but they're also trying to target supply chains for fuel, first of all, uh, railways, and what they expect uh, that should be the ammunition storages of those new ammunition coming to Ukraine, but also shelling from time to time those places where the armed forces are stationing now, so they will not be able to uh, join other forces. For example, we see the targeting around Odessa of the small military bases, so to distract attention and not be able to concentrate all these forces to support Mykolaiv, for example, or to take back uh, Kherson. So definitely we see the certain changes of the tactics. I can't say that's still a strategy, but just tactics change from the uh, uh, Russian side. They are trying to do what they can to demonstrate at least some victory. What gave me the reason to think so, that the rhetorics of the different Russian speakers also changed a little bit within these days. 
from the uh, grand eight years, they started to move uh, uh, saying, oh, we never wanted the whole Ukraine. We just wanted to secure the whole territory of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. We heard it from several top speakers. But also what is interesting, it is extremely uh, painful for the Russian Federation, for the Russian military leadership to lose to Ukrainian armed forces. That's why the last week we noticed that they started saying that they are losing to NATO, that it's not losses to Ukraine. That's because NATO is giving uh, advice or NATO is giving ammunition and more and more it's becoming that uh, the Grand Russian Army can lose only to the Grand NATO Army, but not to uh, something what they perceive as the small Ukrainian army. But because of this, it seems to me that as for now, the main slogan of these uh, weeks, it is that motivation can uh, uh, beat uh, disinformation because the Ukrainian armed forces have motivation. They know why they fight and for what they fight. And the Russian armed forces, as we um, realize more and more, they are living in quite a significant domestic disinformation. So what you hear from the government All right. Hannah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bill, I would also appreciate your assessment of Putin's war aims. And actually, after that, I have another question for you. Bill, are you there? So John, I uh, appreciate uh, your being here, first of all, um, and being here with you. I, I agree with Hannah on, on her uh, analysis of, uh, of war aims. Um, clearly, the Kremlin has reduced its war aims. Uh, it tried in the beginning um, to, uh, to take Kiev, as we know, and to take over um, uh, control, as Hannah has just described, of uh, Ukraine's foreign policy and, and, and even uh, domestic policy. Um, and they failed. Um, the, the Ukrainian military, as General Breedlove has described, um, uh, performed amazingly um, uh, and heroically and successfully in, in defending Kiev against, uh, against that attack. So the, the Russians have reset um, and, uh, and, and are now reduce their, their aims, at least for now, John. And I, I know you've got some concern, I've got concern about their long-term uh, goals may not have changed, uh, but at least for now, um, as Hannah says, they have now focused on the East um, and on the Southeast. Um, and, and the question, it, it, this leads to your question, John, the, the, the question is, is that good enough? Um, they are massing, as General Breedlove has just described, they're massing their forces. Um, they're looking for a way to break through. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, the Ukrainian military has been on this ground uh, for eight years. Uh, they know it well, they've defended well, they know what they're about. Um, I, I'm in touch as we all are with people on the ground uh, uh, in, in just uh, with uh, Ukrainians on the ground in Izum. Um, and, uh, and, and the people, the Ukrainians there describe that thrust from Izum down to the, down to the Southwest as vulnerable. Um, that, that thrust, that attempt to uh, move uh, and, and cut off some of the uh, Ukrainian forces uh, that have been defending Donbass for eight years, uh, that attempt may well, may well backfire. They may well have their, their supplies cut off uh, from the North. All to say that exactly as General Breedlove said, they're ready. They've been thinking about this. And they're not only ready thinking, they're taking actions against that. It may, it may have an effect. Um, it, it, may, um, it may affect the, Ukraini the Ukrainians' ability to defend, and it may affect the Russians' ability to, to take over. So um, war aims um, reduced. Uh, it's now, uh, now to the south. It's not clear that that gets them strategically what they want. And if they should succeed in, in uh, consolidating Donbass, um, the, the Sivazov coast, um, all the way to Kherson uh, and Crimea, they won't be satisfied with that for the long term. Okay. Now, switching to the Ukrainian side, uh, we've seen these dreadful war crimes. Uh, yesterday, Putin, or, or the other day before, he, Putin gave an award to the butchers of Bandarienko and of Buzha basically saying, I approve of the nasty things you did. Uh, and of course, even President Biden's talking about Russian genocide of Ukraine against Ukraine. 
So can Zelensky, as part of a settlement, agree to Russia, Russia having control over this larger swath in the east and the south of the Ukrainian territory, which, you know, puts his civilians in the crosshairs of the Russians? Your question answers itself. Of course not. <laughs> uh, President Zelensky, as, as near as I can tell, will not give up, will not, re will not give up any claim uh, to sovereign Ukrainian territory. Um, he won't give up claim to Crimea or Donbass, and much less any of these uh, uh, moves that the Russians have made. And John, you're exactly right. I mean, these war crimes, uh, these atrocities, that is, as you pointed out, President Biden has called these genocide actions. Um, they motivate the international community. They motivate the Ukrainians. They motivate the Ukrainian military. Even going back to Mariupol, Mariupol is a is a symbol. I think I think General Hodges, Ben Hodges, said that people are going to analyze. Mario, the defense of Mariupol for a long time. And the people of Ukraine are going to award, they already have hero status um, to Mariupol, no matter how it comes out. They are heroes. Um, and, and however that happens, that will, you know, we remember kind of remember things and they will remember Mariupol. Remember Mariupol and that will motivate them going forward and, until, until they win. Okay, thank you. Hannah, I would appreciate also your take as to whether Zelensky could accept a settlement with Russia having control over serious parts of Ukrainian territory? Uh, definitely not, or at least let's say he would not accept the new acquisitions that the Russian forces argued after 21st February. So from what we heard to, uh, from Istanbul negotiations that Ukraine uh, was ready to discuss Crimea and the separate districts of Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, also what we call Donbass, uh, usually uh, uh, at the separate negotiations, it's been said like this. De facto, it meant that we are ready to return back to those negotiations that we had uh, previously, first of all, about Donbass. With Crimea, it is a little bit more difficult because previously Russia was not even going to discuss anything about Crimea. They said it's finished business. And it's been really interesting to hear that after the first round of Istanbul negotiations, uh, they confirmed that they discussed the possibility of negotiations about the status of Crimea. Uh, probably it's been just the uh, um, misspelling, or let's say jumping from their mouth, and uh, in reality they would not be ready. But that's demonstrate the general position that new acquisitions, no, Ukraine definitely would not go for this. But uh, uh, those that have been not under Ukrainian control for the last eight years, it's not that we are rejecting them. They are still uh, are considered as part of Ukraine, and Ukraine would like to return the total control. But at the same time, we are ready to discuss them separately, uh, not within the current ceasefire agreement. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Phil, uh, one, another great Ukrainian victory recently was the sinking of the Moskva the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet and the tormentor of Odessa, you might say. What is the meaning of this, both in terms of the politics of the war, Putin's position in Russia, but perhaps more importantly, uh, the military situation um, in the South? Well, I, it's a great question. And I might just take uh, a little offense with the way you asked it in that more importantly, the military part, because actually may more, maybe more importantly is the emotional and and the representational loss of this ship. So I, I agree well, and understand your premise, but, but I, I just must say that, first of all, no one has lost a capital ship like this since... Uh, since the Falcons, uh, and this is a huge mark on the professionalism of the of the Navy and of those who were giving directions to the Russian Navy that they would leave such a, a critical asset uh, so exposed and then lose it and and clearly be unable to save it after after it was struck, and so this is a blow of immense. Uh, emotional position to Russia. You saw how fast they started to try to cover this with lies and in Moskorovka to lessen the impact. 
And frankly, a lot of people had a, a giggle at that too, because if the crew is so bad that they can't handle a fire aboard and they lose a ship of this size, that's almost as bad a mark as the Ukrainians uh, shooting it with the two Neptune missiles, which we know to be a fact. So a huge mark there. Now, to your point, militarily also a huge impact. Um, this ship was a big part of sort of the A2AD bubble, anti-access area denial bubble that, uh, that Russia was trying to impose on the whole North Sea. Little reported in this uh, conflict is three ships have been shot and damaged uh, by the Russians going in and out of ports in the North Sea. Um, and uh, these are primarily commercial ships flagged outside of uh, NATO, but one of them, I believe, was Estonian owned and flagged. And so uh, Russia has been imposing itself in the Black Sea, and this ship was the centerpiece of Russia being able to impose, impose its position over the ports, et cetera. And, and if um, Russia was going to do anything from the sea against Odessa or to go in and shell again into uh, Mariupol, et cetera, et cetera, this ship would be a center of that effort. And so both in an emotional and in a military sense, this was a huge mark on Russia in general, and specifically the Russian Navy. On the military side, you seem to be saying that maybe the Russian Navy is going to be taken out of the battle for Odessa now. No, no, I, I don't think that. But certainly their ability has been lessened. Their firepower has been lessened and their ability to defend in the north, should there ever be a challenge from the sea, has definitely been lessened. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Hannah, uh, there's been much debate in the United States about support we should send to Ukraine, and Phil and Bill have been part of this, as have I, urging more. What support would you like the Biden administration to send Ukraine now to make sure you do not you defeat this new Kremlin offensive? Yeah, first of all, that's definitely quick support. That's a very important word because uh, uh, not to be uh, as Germans who is promising for 40 days and then still discussing can they send or not. Luckily, with the United States, that is not the situation, but definitely the US cannot be the only country uh, supporting Ukraine military. But if we speak more in the details of the types of the um, equipment and ammunition that Ukraine needs, that's depending on the task. And our task are to protect the sky uh, to protect the coast and to be able to counter assault. So in this case, definitely Ukraine is speaking about any type of the air defense uh, equipment, um, both uh, missiles or the smaller things as uh, um, man pads. Also, we're definitely speaking about the um, uh, air tank, but also recently we started to speak about the anti-ship missiles. And uh, uh, Neptune demonstrated well, uh, but you need to understand that we started using Neptune only since January this year. So Ukraine has just few of them. It's not that we have a big bunch of uh, at, at the storage and we can use them in case of necessity. There are really just few of them. But at the same time, the uh, um, uh, probably the possibility of the assault from the sea is still um, adequate. And you need to understand, it's not just the amphibious possibility of the amphibious assault. That's one uh, problem. But all these ships that are currently in Crimea, they are used as the launching pads de facto, because they have all these caliber uh, missiles, for example, and they are using and shooting just standing at the anchorage in Crimea against uh, uh, towns in the central or western Ukraine. Or recently, we even noticed that the Caspian flotilla uh, being uh, uh, already involved in the uh, in several cases. If you remember, in 2015, Russians already used Caspian flotilla against Syria, less successful, but it means that they are uh, using all capabilities that they have as for now. But still, we are uh, talking with the three main anti-tank, uh, air defense, and uh, anti-ship missiles. And then definitely we're talking more about the smaller things, like, for example, individual uh, um, medical kits, because that's something that you're using a lot. And that's something that our soldiers, unfortunately, will need more and more. OK, thank you. You made a reference to Germany. Uh, what what has happened with the initial promise that they were going to send tanks to Ukraine. What's going on there? 
you know, that's really some mysterious story. Today, at Twitter, it was a fantastic thread when the person been just uh, explaining these statements when uh, Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, promised two billion, uh, that appeared one million. Then he said that we cannot say we don't have enough. Then the generals leaked the information that they have sufficient. Then they said they're in the bad quality. Germany industry said, no, they're in the perfect quality. So that's some kind of the cat and mouse play as for now. And it seems to me that uh, all of uh, Scholz is uh, trying to, uh, as in Ukraine, we say to, to walk between the drops of the rain. So uh, he definitely understands that Germany should support Ukraine, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't want to do it. But also he is not sure in the capabilities of the Bundeswehr. And we know that especially with tanks and few other types of ammunition, recently they had an audit and they've been problems. So probably he is also just trying to uh, secure himself a little bit in these discussions. Uh, very interesting. I have a friend who's a very sharp observer of the German scene who's based in Berlin, who says he thinks that bad German policies are sneaking back in. I hope that's wrong. Anyway, okay. Uh, Bill, President Zelensky has said that any final peace agreement must include real security guarantees of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Is this a possibility? So John, first of all, um, President Zelensky and uh, Hannah mentioned the conversations in Istanbul, these negotiations um, were serious on the part of the Ukrainians. They, they sent a serious delegation. Um, um, they had some ideas, um, one of which uh, John used to refer to, that is the security guarantees uh, um, in the event um, that the Ukrainians would, uh, would not pursue NATO membership and instead would, uh, would uh, um, pursue a Austrian model, an Austrian model of neutrality that, uh, um, that uh, would allow them, of course, to join the EU as they are well on the way to do, um, uh, not join NATO um, under the Austrian model, um, have a very serious self-defense capability um, but beyond the self-defense capability, uh, which would be the ultimate guarantee um, that the Ukrainians need and would have to have in any negotiation, um, were these security guarantees that they had proposed. I, I say all that, that was part of the discussion three weeks ago. Um, I am not sure, based on what's happened for the last three weeks in terms of the of the atrocities, of the war crimes, of uh, what President Biden calls genocide. I'm not sure that those negotiations are real any longer. I'm not sure, you know, it's up to the Ukrainians and we'll support the Ukrainians, whatever they, whatever they decide. But I hear, I'm hearing less and less enthusiasm uh, from the Ukrainians uh, for pursuing that kind of a negotiation with the Russians. If the Russians can do what they've been doing, uh, these atrocities that we're seeing, then it's not clear you can have the, any kind of negotiations with them. So in answer to your question, John, about, uh, uh, about security guarantees, um, if these negotiations get serious again, um, and if the Ukrainians uh, uh, do offer neutrality, which I'm not sure they will after all of this, um, but then, then the question comes up that you raise, and that is security guarantees. Um, if the Ukrainians come to the Americans, come to the United States and ask us for security guarantees, not just like uh, the Budapest Memorandum, uh, assurances that uh, Ambassador Pfeiffer uh, negotiated. Uh, no, uh, if the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians learned that lesson um, and assurances, uh, Budapest Memorandum assurances are not good enough. Um, they, the Ukrainians will want, if again, if they pursue this, I'm not sure they will, but if they do, they will want Article 5 NATO guarantees. They will want a legally binding Senate ratified agreement treaty um, that says if they're attacked, then the United States and other guarantor nations um, would come to their aid right away um, with military um, on the ground. So this is serious. And the United States, in my view, John, um, ought to consider that if they come to this. Again, I am 
that was a discussion of three weeks ago. And, and since then, I think the enthusiasm for those kinds of negotiations, maybe even the enthusiasm for neutrality um, has, uh, has diminished uh, dramatically. I'd be interested in Hannah's thoughts about that. Before I turn to Hannah, though, I just want to come back to you. I'm not going to let you escape. Uh, you, you gave a very nuanced response, an excellent response. Uh, but here's my very specific question. In light of these nasty things that we've learned about the behavior of Russian military in Ukraine, the atrocities, the war crimes, perhaps even genocidal acts, do you think that support is growing in the United States, maybe not quite visibly yet, for the type of guarantees that Zelensky would require if we reach that point? John, I think it, it is growing. I think the answer to your question is yes, it is growing for the reasons that you said, but it might be in a different context. It might be, you know, maybe that growing support for Ukraine in opposition to the Russians um, in response to these atrocities, these genocidal acts, maybe that increasing support means we should revisit NATO membership. Maybe that means we're not talking about neutrality. Maybe that means we're talking about Ukraine in NATO. Um, anyways, uh, I hope that debate is is uh, uh, is beginning in the United States. Well, I'll, I'll just say this, and Phil may want to jump in a little bit later. Um, I've heard some retired military saying, "Boy, we'd like those Ukrainian fighters in NATO." <laughs> okay, Hannah, do you want to jump in on this um, Bill's comments about how this might play out? Yeah, uh, quite briefly. You know what I'm joking, Rasmus, that for all these years we heard about possible Finlandization of Ukraine. As for now, we are talking about Ukrainization of Finland, uh, meaning that even <laughs> Finland decided to join NATO. And uh, uh, that's why for me, it's so strange to hear that uh, um, so Ukraine even uh, uh, discussing the possibility of bringing the neutral status, because we see that two countries with the longest history of neutrality decided to, to join NATO. But at the same time, uh, okay, everybody uh, knew that I'm very pro-NATO and pro-Ukrainian membership, uh, but even I'm taking off this uh, hat uh, from me, I'm very practical. I'm asking, okay, what should be, let's make the list, what type of the security guarantees of what I heard, providing weapons, okay, we are receiving them now. It is still individual decision of the country. Uh, or new fly zone, we understand that still that will be separate decisions. What else? Article 5 for something similar to this. We already heard even from one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine, the United Kingdom, that no, Article 5 it is collective defense. It's only for NATO Article 5. It can't be in the bilateral agreement. So for me, that is the first question. Give me the exact list of what can be these guarantees or these actions in case of the attack. And I would say, is it possible or not? The second problem for me is the list of guarantors. Um, not even discussing that the Ukrainian delegation said that the more we have, the better. Not always more is better. But at the same time, whom we heard, sorry, I don't believe in the security guarantees from Israel, China, Germany, and Italy and France. And these five countries being named over there. And that, that's really a question. And uh, the last but not the least, I don't want um, to have the long-term consequences, because what we hear now mostly from the security guarantees, that is the short-term vision. But without the strategic understanding of the long-term consequences, uh, even from such a small thing, uh, have you ever seen any neutral state that would uh, uh, negotiate their uh, military exercises at their territory with other countries, with their security guarantors? I've never heard about anything like this. And that's what's been proposed over there. That is the exact limiting of our sovereignty. Or then the most strongest uh, types of their uh, another country guarantee security, that is US-Japan relations, especially if we speak about 60s. How it's been guaranteed by the US bases in Japan. And uh, here in the discussion, we already heard that no foreign uh, military set the territory of Ukraine. So de facto, all those uh, exact proposals that I heard, they're just diminishing, but not increasing Ukrainian security. That's why for me, that's a little bit strange. It's not about NATO or not NATO. It is about very big predictability of, okay, how will it look like? Okay, thank you. And I agree with you that the only guarantee that really matters would be a U.S. guarantee. Okay, General Breedlove, uh, the administration last week announced a new military aid package worth $800 million to Ukraine, which included 18 units of I-155 artilleries, um, armored personnel carriers, and switchback drones. 
Now this week, there's another new package of roughly that same size. Very interesting, a little bit unusual to have two packages one after the other, although a good thing. And these now include multiple rocket launchers and maybe some other stuff. So is this support, last week's package, this week's package, sufficient to help Ukraine deal with the much larger and better equipped Russian forces in the East and South? And what should the administration do to help Ukraine win this upcoming fight? So um, your last sentence was the most important sentence you said. And that is this government needs to make a decision that Ukraine needs to win this fight. We don't wanna talk about keeping them in the fight. We don't wanna talk about giving them what they need. We want to talk about giving them what they need to ensure that they win the fight. It would be good to hear our administration say that. And then all kinds of goodness would flow down from that thereafter. Of course, the first 800 million, we are thankful for that, John. I mean, everything that we can get to them, we're thankful for. But that first package was missing some very important things. Uh, and and uh, while we gave them howitzers, we essentially gave them one battalion worth. And we believe they're facing as many as 73 battalion task groups on the other side. And so one battalion worth is good, way better than nothing, but it is inadequate to task and we need to be sending more. In this second batch, of course, now because we there was a hue and cry about why no MLRS, we're beginning maybe to see conversations about MLRS, which I think is vitally important to what is happening now right now, today on the battlefield in East Ukraine. So it's a good decision and I hope we can move it, but it's already gonna be late to need. So we need to push hard to get MLRS there and considering tanks uh, as well, in my opinion. The 113s are awesome. I'm glad they gave them to them. They are a good transportation device on the battlefield. But let's just remind that Captain Phil Breedlove in the early 80s when he served with the U.S. Army in Europe was phasing out 113s in the 2nd Brigade 3rd Infantry Division where I served. So they were being phased out of our military in the 80s. Since then, we've had the Bradleys. There are also Bradleys in storage that we should be thinking about. Much more firepower, much more capability on the battlefield. So I think there's things we need to think through. So again, before it sounds too negative, we are happy for what is being done. We need to think about giving them the power to fight and win, uh, not uh, subside on the battlefield. And then I think the last question is, Yesterday, there was some confusion, I think, introduced. I, I'm trying to find the exact words used by our administration, but it appears we said that uh, aircraft had been provided to Ukraine. Um, there's confusion there. This morning, the Ukraine military, the Ukraine Air Force tweeted out clearly that uh, no aircraft are being provided, that aircraft parts are being provided. So there's some confusion here on aircraft that we've got to clean up and look at because we do, in my opinion, need to help the Ukrainian Air Force to try to hold the Russian Air Force at bay, especially as they attack into the east. Okay, Phil, thank you for that. All right, Bill, I'll give you the last word before we turn to audience questions. And also, what do you think the U.S. should be doing to help Ukraine win this war? John, uh, uh, I agree with General Breedlove that um, that the the hardware that we're talking about here with MLRS, MLRS uh, is necessary in volume. Then we need to send a lot, um, uh, and uh, the armored vehicles, whether they be the one one threes or the Bradleys. Um, uh, Captain Taylor was also uh, in the uh, uh, in that theater um, uh, with the Second Armored Cavalry Regiment, um, who had Bradleys. Um, uh, and, and so those are capable and they're mobile. Um, um, they're, apparently they're talking about uh, Humvees. So, and there are, we know there are a lot of, of uh, armored Humvees that can help move around. And the Ukrainian military has been so good at being quick and nimble um, and, uh, and able to take advantage of that mobility. So the Humvees, the 113s, Bradleys, uh, I think this is all important and John, um, what we talked about earlier, this uh, these atrocities, 
these, you know, if it is true, what, what, uh, what President Biden said, if it, is, if it is indeed genocide, then we should be doing everything to stop it. We should be doing everything short of weapons of mass destruction. Um, we should be doing everything that we can to allow, enable the Ukrainians to stop the genocide. And what that means is all of these, all this equipment that we're talking about, that needs to come right now. I mean, that ought to just inject urgency um, into this effort to do exactly what General Brito says, not to, not to hold on, to win. The Ukrainians need to defeat the Russians, um, uh, at least at this time, because we know, as you mentioned earlier, John, they'll be back. But if they're defeated now, and if the sanctions stay on, which they should, that will reduce their ability, inhibit their ability to restock to rearm, um, and and that will mean that the Russians are in a bad way over the over the coming time. So all to say that we need to go everything. We the, there's no the limit is only weapons of mass destruction that we should be providing. Okay, Hannah, I should have given you a word here too. So if you want to comment on what the U.S. should be doing beyond what you've already said, um, here's your chance. Now let's go to the questions because we can talk for hours about the uh, exact uh, types of the ammunition that we need. And I understand that for non-military audience, that's probably will be less interesting. Okay, that's good. All right. We have a question from Dana Bort. And Phil, I think I'll give this to you. You touched upon it in what you just said, but not entirely. Um, he says, he asks, recent reports in the news convey that Ukraine has now additional fighter jets, not just aircraft, but fighter jets provided by other countries. Do we know how many and how may this may change the war? And for that matter, if these reports are true. Well, as I sort of mentioned, I think there's a lot of confusion here because what apparently, and I'm at a bit, bit of a disadvantage, I didn't hear the exact words that our, our administration used yesterday, but apparently what our administration said yesterday is not in line with what the Ukrainian Air Force and the Ukrainian administration said this morning. So we need to sort this out. I think the bottom line is uh, I have long uh, appealed for more jets for Ukraine. I'm on record for that. So the fact that that we need to get them some in my mind is is real. But now we we have some confusion about what's actually going on. I think what the Ukrainians said this morning is they're getting parts for their older aircraft. Maybe our administration sees that as that makes more aircraft available by sending in parts. I don't know what the confusion is, but we need to sort it out. All right, thank you. Um, we have several questions relating to possible Kremlin use of weapons of mass destruction. I'll read all of them and then we'll give you a chance to answer. Um, one from James Doran says, could continued failure, i.e. the Ukrainians continue to resist, tempt Putin to resort to theater nuclear weapons or CW, chemical weapons or biological weapons. From Harlan Ullman, Putin has threatened use of nuclear weapons and Bill Burns, the head of the CIA, has warned that use could not, should not be dismissed. Suppose the offensive in the East fails. What do we do now to prevent Putin from using nuclear weapons? Actually, and last, last question, oops, there it is. From Mark Torriano, do you think Putin resorts to tactical nuclear strikes soon? And if so, how will NATO get involved? So uh, I think all of our panelists may want to comment this, but Phil, we'll start with you. So there will be way better remarks from my uh, brothers and sisters on the panel. So let me start with the opening round. And that is the first and most important thing we need to realize about these nukes is Mr. Putin might actually use them. But more importantly, Mr. Putin is counting on us being deterred by his threats. Uh, and that is the first hurdle I think we have to get over in the West. We are almost completely deterred in the West now by these threats of nukes. We were also deterred by the, the threat of World War III. I think we sort of are already in World War III. Uh, um, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, Mr. Putin is counting on us being deterred so that he retains freedom of action all the way from gross atrocities to legitimate battles. He retains freedom of action and he's using them. I'll stop there and let the other two okay. carry the Thank rest you. of the conversation. Hannah? 
Um, if we speak about Mr. Putin himself and maybe Mr. Shegu, uh, they definitely would like to use something that big. They like to play with the big toys. And we heard it from their statements and we heard it previously even before February. They talked a lot about the preventing uh, tactical nuclear strike that you can find in their updated nuclear strategy. Another question is that we know that there were already disputes inside of the uh, administration that a lot of people understand to, to what level uh, such developments can lead to the current warfare. And uh, the only hope is that you need not one person just to push the red button, but you need uh, uh, the, the certain uh, uh, process, uh, let's say, for initiating. Uh, so definitely uh, uh, there are certain hope that this internal opposition that is starting to appear will probably prevent. But also definitely we need to understand what type of the nuclear strike they can have. They have capabilities for all types, but probably nobody is speaking now about the big blast or something like what we imagine from the uh, uh, August uh, 1945. Because uh, uh, we are talking more and more about the uh, tactical, about something smaller. Uh, so that can be uh, uh, some of the areas, uh, definitely as far from uh, um, the NATO border as possible, because uh, um, we we fear that that is a certain fear. We feel that that is certain fear uh, inside the Russian administration uh, of the bold uh, reaction from the NATO member states. OK, thank you, Bill. John, uh, Bill Burns went on to say, you quoted him, um, uh, and Harold Ullman um, quoted him, uh, but Bill Burns went on to say that they're watching it carefully. Of course, CIA is watching this. This is a, among the things they look at as, as closely and as carefully as any. Um, and so far, they don't see any reason to believe that the Russians are actually taking steps um, in preparation for any of that kind of a decision. And Han is right. This is a complicated decision. And there are multi, there, hopefully there are people in the chain of command um, who uh, are hesitant to do that. But um, I could then go back to General Breedlove's point, um, which is we should not be deterred by these threats. We should take them seriously. Uh, but again, I go back to the, the, the genocide question. If it's indeed genocide, John, we should be taking all these. We should not be self-deterred. We should be taking steps, everything, everything up to, we should be giving the Ukrainians everything up to, and, uh, but not including weapons of mass destruction, so that they can stop the genocide. And, and, and if, that's, if that's risky, we should take that risk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I, I have a, a logistics question. So John, uh, John, a short two finger. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, please. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose uh, one more thought on this deterrence thing. Okay. Well, uh, most of us learned in war college that you want to deter your enemy and not have your enemy deter you. And most of us learned in war college that you want to seize and hold the initiative, not cede the initiative to your enemy. In this conflict, we have gotten on the backside of both of those. So I think we need to start thinking about how we regain the initiative and force Mr. Putin to react to us. And I think we need to start asking the tough, the, the tough questions about how do we re-deter Mr. Putin? Because he is not deterred right now. And we want him to feel deterred as well. So I think these are two really tough questions, but we need to begin to consider them. Sorry for interrupting. Well, no, no, I agree with that. I would simply add, if we're going to be deterred from defending Ukraine with weapons because Putin is threatening us with nukes, what happens if he moves on the Baltics? Right? Okay. Uh, we have we have a, a logistics question, which is highly pertinent. It's from uh, Barry Smith. I guess this is for you, Phil. What is the state of the Ukrainian supply lines to the East? And how does that, how might that impact the battle? Well, it's a really good question. Ukraine has done a good job to this point. Uh, we Again, we need to give them credit for doing some good diversification of how they move things forward. It hasn't worked perfectly. Um, realize that we didn't get a lot of what Mariupol needed to Mariupol before it was encircled and now it's too late without tough action to get stuff in there. So it, it's not perfect so far, but I do believe that um, they've done a good, good job. But what you hear now is even the press starting to ask this question. And you see the Russians beginning to use their long range strikes 
to address some rear area things. I do believe that we cannot absolutely assume that we will have free passage from the various NATO nations into Ukraine with supplies. And I think that not only the Ukrainians are gonna have to work on this, but I keep trying to use the personal pronoun we. When are we gonna become involved in making sure the right kind of kit gets forward to the, to the fighting forces? Okay, thank you. Hannah, do you have any comments on this? Very brief, uh, we need to remember that the benefits of Ukraine that we are on our ground. So when we talk about the supply of some of the things, we don't need the supply exactly moving from NATO countries from the West to the East. We also still have the storages of uh, many of the basic stuff uh, in each of the regions because more or less some of the governors been preparing for this. It's not probably about all ammunition, but still uh, uh, definitely when you speak about food supply or uh, water supply or other types like these, you are talking about more of the smaller regions uh, chains rather than uh, the whole Ukraine. And that helps because a lot of the locals are assisting when the soldiers are on the ground. And these uh, local support sometimes plays very uh, significantly for them in terms of materials, in terms of food and volunteers. Don't forget that you have both the chains organized by uh, the state and the chains of supply organized by the volunteers organizations. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Jack Kropansky. Um, Bill, I think this will be, we'll start with you. Will an insurgency change Russian's behavior or just increase their level of repression um, on innocent civilians? So first of all, Jack, don't talk about insurgency. The, the government of Ukraine is the legitimate government. It will continue to be the legitimate government. Um, it's not mounting an insurgency. So take that word out. We're not talking about insurgency. We're talking about continued resistance. And if your question is about continued resistance by civilians, by the territorial defense forces, by partisans, um, then yes, um, that is, a, that's, you know, the Ukrainians know how to do this. As I said earlier, the Ukrainians are very good at uh, dispersed uh, actions. Um, they are very good at, uh, at the territorial defense. They have been working on this for months. Um, and that, that continued re resistance, not insurgency, Jack, we're not talking about insurgency, um, but that continued resistance um, will be effective. And if the Russians try to maintain um, this, uh, this swath of, of territory that they've now, they are going to have a hard time. They're going to have a hard time. Um, that land bridge that they're so proud of um, is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to this kind of attack. Um, you talked about supply. Our supply lines or the Ukraine supply lines from the west to the east. The Russians have problems with their supply lines. The Russians have problems with their their railroads. Um, and again, it's because the Ukrainian resistance um, um, is attacking those uh, those railroads. So so they've got they've got their own set of problems. But again. Let's be clear about who's, you know, insurgency implies uh, well, one set of things that we know about. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about resistance and partisan and civilian defense. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Wayne Schroeder. And um, General Breedlove, this is for you. How will the Russian performance in the war impact long-term NATO defense planning? And what do you expect the new NATO strategic concept will look like following the Madrid summit? So uh, to the first point, uh, I would hope that we don't learn wrong lessons immediately. Um, what we're finding out about Russia is that for the two decades at least after the wall fell, where we were, as I try to say, hugging the bear, trying to bring Russia into the West and Western set of values and et cetera, et cetera, we were completely wrong. All the time we were trying to bring them towards the West, they were preparing themselves for the kind of things that we're looking at right now. In 08, we got a clear message and we got past that message so fast and tried to get back to hugging the bear and making bad assumptions about the bear right off the bat. And now we're suffering from some of those decisions as we're trying to rebuild NATO and rebuild the forces in NATO. And so uh, my hope and prayer would be that we not learn bad lessons 
um, and uh, make assumptions that will hurt us in our ability to defend against this very enemy. I was just in um, uh, Europe last week meeting with NATO members, with SACUR and others. And one of the great nations that I met with has really reoriented their de defensive thinking. They have seen what Russia does to cities and they don't now want to give up any of their land in trade for time to allow NATO to get ready to fight. So, I, I mean, what I'm trying to say is the reaction of the nations is we used to think about trade a little space for time for NATO to generate and be here. And now that they see what Russia is doing in its modern form of warfare, taking the fight to the civilian populace, destroying all of the civilian infrastructure, et cetera. And these nations don't want to be fighting on their territory. They want to meet and defeat at the border as best they can. So I hope that, I hope that, uh, and several conversations were nations talking the same way. I hope that we're going to relook at that strategic concept to say, we have to be ready to fight farther forward, more forward to stop Russia before it comes in and does in the rest of uh, the nations of Europe, Moldova, Georgia, and NATO. We don't want to see what they're doing to our brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now. John, if I can just make a point Please. on that, if that's all right. Please. Um, this is why Ukraine has to win. This is why Ukraine has to win this fight for exactly that reason. We do not want the Russians um, in Ukraine, we do not. We we want we want to defend forward, and Ukraine is defending forward now for us, and they need to win this fight. Um, Bill, I want to tie a bow on the package you just presented me. Um, critics of our su the support, which we all think agree is not sufficient, from the United States to Ukraine, say the United States has no dog in this fight. Um, it seems to me what you just said says Ukraine is fighting our fight and we have a vital interest in their success. Any comments? I totally agree with you, John. I totally agree with you agreeing with me um, <laughs> that, uh, that Ukraine is on the front line. Ukraine is fighting our fight. It's our fight against the Russians. It's our it's democratic fight against autocracy. Ukraine is fighting our fight. They're on the front line. We need to support them. Okay. We have a question from Rory Coppinger Symes. I think Bill, this is for you. What part do you envisage China playing in resolving the war? If any, so it's a good question, John. Um, uh, the Chinese are are they're observing carefully what's going on here. Um, the Chinese are probably surprised at a bunch of things. They're probably surprised um, at the severity of the economic sanctions that the West has placed on Russia. I I suspect that the Chinese realize how vulnerable they are. This is a new weapon. Um, and, and we've used this economic weapon in a way that we've never used before. I mean, this is the harshest set of sanctions that we've put on any nation ever. And the Chinese noticed that, number one. Number two, the Chinese may have thought, maybe Putin thought, but President Xi may have thought that the Americans were sitting back or, or content to withdraw or, or wanted to focus internally instead of leading the world. Well, they're surprised. And here's the United States, again, leading the world against the Russians, defending democracy and defending Ukraine um, in, in this fight. And I think the Chinese are probably surprised by that too. They're probably further surprised by the unity of this alliance, uh, not just within Europe, but also on their, you know, with the South Koreans and the Japanese and the Australians and the New Zealanders, the Chinese are watching this, and I imagine they're taking some lessons. Okay, we have one minute. I have one, I have one more question I want to ask. Phil, I know you've got to leave exactly at 10, so I'll give you first. It's from Deborah Kagan. Um, four senators are proposing a quote-unquote Ukraine czar as a better approach for longer-term funding. This would imply for years. Any thoughts on this? In other words, someone in the U.S. taking control of Ukraine policy, working it full-time. Phil, any thoughts? Then Bill and then Hannah. Um, I'm, I'm going to be real short. I, I would not oppose such a thing. I, I just really believe we need to be focused on something and winning would be a great place to start okay. and get somebody focused and held accountable, pin the rose on their chest and hold them accountable. And frankly, I do understand what our, our current com, um, 
administration said when it came in that it was going to be a Department of State lead and not a Department of Defense lead under this administration. But I really believe we need to hear more from the Department of Defense on this matter now. This is a war that that Russia is going to carry on with the ugliest of tools and the ugliest of methods. And we need to have, I think, a firm military approach to what we're doing in Ukraine. Thank you. Bill, 30 seconds. Just, just real quickly, uh, yeah, I would agree that there ought to be a, uh, a general in charge of the military aspects of that. And I think there should be a civilian in charge of the assistance to, and then the reconstruction of. There's going to be, you know, when the Ukrainians win, and the Ukrainians will win, John, when they win, then there's going to be an enormous reconstruction effort, and there needs to be a coordinated effort on the part of the United States. And and a part of the international community. Okay, thank you. Hannah, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, the issue is that uh, definitely the task that we have now and will have, they're not only on the DOD or uh, State Department, they're much wider. And Ukraine will need all support possible. Will it be one person in coordination of everything? Or there will be as many as possible uh, that's better for the U.S. counterparts to decide. But we need support of the Congress. We need support of Ministry of Justice, of Economy, of USAID, of State Department, and even of the U.S. lawyers, because we know that now we would have a lot of the cases about war crimes, about the return of the property, of many other things. And here, all hands are in house. Thank you very much, Hannah, Bill, Phil. And thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be doing something in the week or two again on the subject. Thanks, John.